Family Theatre presents James Gleason and Hugh O'Brien. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theatre, presents Caboose, starring James Gleason and Hugh O'Brien. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Now to our transcribed drama, Caboose, starring James Gleason as Pop and Hugh O'Brien as Bob Plank. much longer it's going to be. What's the difference? We're on company time. Yeah. Have you uh, ever been up here in the executive offices before? Yeah, once, a couple of years ago. <laughs> but not for anything like this. They were retiring one of the engineers, give him a gold watch. Perfect safety record, 25 years with the road. Yeah? Hey, uh, what's this Rogers guy like? Well, I hear he's what you'd expect. Assistant to the president, big bag of wind. Pretty tough? Plenty tough. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's all out in the open now. Don't have to lie about it anymore. Mr. Rogers will see you now, gentlemen. Right this way, please. Mr. Frisbee? That's right. And Plank? Yes, sir. Sit down, please. You got your book, Miss Spooner? Uh, yes, Mr. Rogers. I'll tell you when to start taking this down. Yes, sir. Well, gentlemen, I need not remind you how serious this is. Oh, we understand. Yes, sir. I'd like to make it clear from the outset that a transcript of everything you tell me will be on Mr. Claxon's desk as soon as it can be typed up. You'll then decide personally what action should be taken. You mean whether we'll be fired or not? Among other things, yes. And I trust you both appreciate the inconvenience to which this is putting him. Oh, yes, sir. He must be a pretty busy man. Well, busy is hardly the word. Presiding over a railroad is a task of unexampled complexity. Yes, sir. Now, as to the bare facts... You were both assigned as brakemen on the 836 freight of Winnebago last night. Yes. That's right. You, Frisbee, according to my records, uh, you've been with the road for nine years. Yes, sir. And you plank less than six months. Mm, that's right. Says here that you've been working as a switch tender until this week. Uh, that's right, sir. Last night was my first run as a brakeman. Very well. Suppose we begin at the beginning. I take it the freight pulled out on schedule, Frisbee? 8.36 on the dot, sir. Start taking this down, Miss Booney. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Yes, Blank. Well, it was something that happened before we pulled out of Winnebago that really started the whole thing. Then included, by all means. Well, it was about 20 minutes before our scheduled time of departure. You're getting this, Miss Booney. Yes, sir. I remember the time because I'd been standing on the station platform out of the rain, and I could see the clock on the wall of the telegrapher's shack. It was just a minute or two past 8.15... Frisbee had told me to get to the caboose early and check the flares and extra signal batteries because, well, he might not be back until the last minute. So I started down along the main track to the freight siding where the 836 was standing. It was plenty dark, and, well, like I say, it was raining hard. The last thing in the world I ever expected was for someone to be out in that freight yard who didn't belong there. Bobby? Bobby, is that you? Who's that? It's me. Alice. What are you doing here? You've got to help me, Bobby. Me help you? Get out of here. Oh, listen to me. It's important. Ben's with me. Where? Don't get mad, please. I couldn't help Where him. is he? Waiting over there, under the signal tower. Did he marry him? Yes, we... We're going away as soon as we can. What does that mean? Ben wants you to do something for him. He promised me he won't ever bother you again if you do. Do what? I'd rather have Ben tell you. Come on. I can't see him now. My train pulls out in less than ten minutes. Well, it's about the train. Hello, Bobby. 
guess you never expected to see me again. What's Alice it? talking about? What do you want? You didn't want me to ask you this, but I'm going to ask you anyhow. There's something you'll be carrying in that caboose tonight I'd like to have. In the caboose? Mm -hmm. Come on, Bobby, don't dummy up now, There's on nothing me. in the caboose except the coal stove and a couple of chairs. What are you getting at? Where's that other brake button that's making the run with you? I had a call from the station master about a half hour ago. I haven't seen him since. I guess he's the one. Okay, you don't know anything about it. Let's just keep it that way. Look, what is this? I'm going to be on that freight tonight. Oh, now, wait a minute. You're look. You're going to give me what that partner of yours brings back from the station master. Listen, I'll listen. I'll make it look good. I'll come into the caboose sometime while he's up checking the other cars. So there won't be any witnesses. You get a bump on the head, you won't know anything. I ought to cave your face in. Yeah, but you won't, Bobby. You'll do just what I tell you. We both know why. You got that, Miss Spooner? Uh, yes, sir. I gather then, Plank, that you were well acquainted with the two people who approached you last night in the freight yard. Yes, sir. Alice, uh, she used to be my girl. I thought she was, anyway. And the man called Ben? Uh, ben Dixon. I met him in the Army two years ago. I'd been in some trouble, and, well, he knew about it. Then he was holding it over your head? Yeah. The list something that Dixon said would be carried in the caboose last night. Did you have any idea what it was? Oh, no, sir, not then. Not until Frisbee got back to the caboose. And then you asked him? Well, no, not exactly. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Yes, Frisbee. I don't want you to get the idea that Bob tried to pump anything out of me. As soon as I climbed aboard, I told him what the deal was. I had to. Had to? Well, I mean, here I was wearing a pistol and carrying this mail pouch with a lock on it. I, I had to say something. Oh, I suppose so. Yeah, this explanation took place before the old man boarded the train. Yeah, most of it anyway. We didn't pick up pop until we got down to the water tower. Considering the circumstances, Frisbee, would you say you acted wisely in taking aboard an unauthorized passenger last night? Now, how's that? Leaving aside for a moment the fact that the road has a strict rule prohibiting such a thing, you were carrying with you over $6,000 of its money. Mr. Rogers, this was Pop. He's been hitching rides on the road for years. Have you ever seen him before? Yeah, once, about five years ago, but everybody's seen him at one time or another. Mm. Why? So you picked him up at the water tower. Yeah, that's right. I, I'd noticed when I first boarded the train back in the freight yard that uh, Bob was nervous. Take us down, Miss Boone. I'm getting it. Proceed, Frisbee. Well, as I say, I could see he was nervous, but uh, I thought it was just on account of the money we were carrying. Well, we started up, and the train moved out through the yard. It was still raining, and... Bob was standing on the back platform of the caboose, leaning out into the dark like he was looking for something up toward the cars in front. It was about five minutes later when we pulled alongside the water tower. Hey! Hey, feller! Who's that? Beats me. He's someone standing under the water tower. How about a lift for the Sack City? Oh, sorry, mister. It's against the rules, you know. Oh, oh, rules. I know all about the rules. I'm Pop. Pop Stack. Like in Smokestack. Like you got on that engine up front. Oh, what do you know? Well, hiya, Pop. You know this guy? Well, sure he does, sonny. Let's see, four years ago last August, you give me a ride from Belle Plain to Tama, right? <laughs> you don't forget much, do you? I don't forget your name either. It's Frisbee. Walt Frisbee. <laughs> and you live down in Bentonsport. <laughs> Come on up, Pop. Get in out of the rain. Listen, we can't carry any passengers. Oh, today. take it easy. It's What's all right. matter, Sonny? You a stockholder well, or it's something? It's nothing personal, mister. It's just... I won't add but 160 pounds to the hull load. That's okay, Pop. This is his first run. He's a little eager. Come on in. Come on. We got a fire going. Look, Walt. Will you settle down? I'm the senior man on this run. I take the responsibility. Come on inside, Pop. Hey, huh? Uh, this is cozy. <laughs> take off your coat and hang it on that chair there by the stove. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could take my beard off and dry it out the same way. <laughs> How about some coffee? Yes, sir. Got a cup right here in my bindle. One of them army cups they use with canteens, you know. Yeah, well, we got an extra mug. Yeah, but with my army cup, I'll get more. Holds more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, suit yourself, Pop. Say, I got a can of tomato soup, too. You fellas like some soup? Sonny? Uh, no, thanks. Uh, you, you keep it, Pop. <laughs> you may need it. Well, I'm at that. And again, I may not. I'm going where it's warm. Here. Here you are. Have some coffee, huh? Well, thank you. Ah. Hey, that's a throat full right there. Mm. Ah. Oh, that'll dry me off. Say, uh, how come you wearing a gun? Special job, Pop. Uh, must be. 
Well, here we go. Yes, sir. Must be a mighty special job. Never seen a brakeman wearing a gun before. Road cops, uh, plenty, but never a brakeman. Where are you headed, Pop? New Orleans. Mardi Gras. <laughs> job got anything to do with that mail sack hanging on that hook over there? Maybe. Where are you coming from? Rose Bowl game. Great contest. Great competitors. Sold programs. Hey, Walt, uh, you think I'd better check the cars now that we're in the way, huh? Well, there's no special yeah, rush. Yeah, well, I figure we, well, we can't be too careful tonight, you know. Okay, suit yourself, kid. If you want anything, I'll be right here by the coal stove. Yeah, well, I, I won't be long. Well, I bet it's mighty wet up on them catwalks, sonny. You watch your step. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, he's an edgy one, huh? Oh, he's just eager. Hey, how about some checkers, Pump? My pleasure. Say, uh, you think it's that mail sack that's got your friends so worried? Pop, you're getting a free ride. You just keep your mind on these checkers and let me worry about the mail sack, huh? You want the red or the black? Red. Oh, can't say I really blame him for worrying with you carrying a gun and all. Well, he'd worry anyway. I think he's trying to make a name for himself. That's not an easy thing to do. Well, this kid may find it easier than most. He don't look like to me like he's got much push. You know the old saying, Pop, in this world it ain't so much the push you got as the pull. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> this boy got pull? Well, the talk is uh, that's how he got the job. Oh, ain't it that way? Them as has gets. That, that's another old saying. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead, Pop. It's your move. Yeah, I guess it is at that. Uh, just a moment, Miss Bloom. Uh, yes, sir. Question, Frisbeen. Sure. Seems to me this, uh, pop person displayed considerable curiosity as to the contents of the mail sack. Didn't that strike you as suspicious? No, not especially. Then why not? Well, because that was his way. If he was curious about something, he just kept asking and asking until you finally gave him the answer. And did you finally give him an answer? No, not until it was all over. <laughs> then it didn't seem to matter much. I see. To resume, then, you say you were just out of Winnebago when Plank left the caboose to check the other freight cars. That's right. How long was he gone? Mm, not more than ten minutes, I'd say. Uh, does that coincide with your recollection of the facts, Plank? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about right, Mr. Rogers. Wouldn't you say that ten minutes is a very short time in which to complete a single-handed check of the couplings and hatches on a 16-car train? Yes, sir. I... Well, that's not really why I went out. It was to see if Ben was aboard. Oh, the man who approached you in the freight yard. Yes, sir. Continue, Plank, continue. Well, it was still raining when I closed the door of the caboose and stepped out onto the platform. The way I figured it, uh, Ben, not knowing much about freights or how to move around on them, would probably hide himself as close to the caboose as he could. So I climbed up to the top of the first car forward and started along the catwalk on my hands and knees only gone about six feet when I remembered the inspection hatch on the corner of the roof. I crawled over to it and tried the cover. Sure enough, the seal was broken. Ben! Ben Dixon, you down there? It's me. What do you want? I've got to talk to you. Something's gone wrong. Go on, Don. Close that top after you. Got any extra batteries for your flashlight? No, not, not with me. Mine's going kind of dim. Yeah, we won't need it anyhow. You gotta get off the train. You getting chicken, Bobby? Look, it isn't gonna work. There's someone else riding in the caboose. Who? An old guy, Pop somebody, Frisbee, picked him up at uh, the water tower. So what? So he'll recognize you, that's what. How far are you taking him? <sighs> All the way to Sac City. It'll be daylight before he gets off. Look, you're gonna have to forget it. <laughs> Says you. Listen, Dixon, this isn't just army style pilfering. It's big stuff. Six thousand dollars worth. That's why I am not about to forget it. Uh, well, I'm not taking the fall for you for this time. Who said you would? Ben, it can't work. If I notice the seal on that hatch was broken, Frisbee will see the same thing when he makes his rounds. I figure he will. Well, what you may not figure is that he's got a gun. What do you think this is? Well, that does it. Deal me out. All right, listen. Listen good. You're in this to stay, and nobody's gonna get hurt unless you want them to. And what about Frisbee? Just like you. Tap on the head, he'd be nice and warm down here. 
The old guy? Same thing. Keep his back to the door of that caboose. You never even see me come in. What do I say to Frisbee when he comes to and wants to know how come I didn't notice the broken seal on that hatch when I checked the cars, You huh? just missed it, that's all. Oh, it was raining hard, you missed it. You made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, like I made a mistake covering for you two years ago. Forget it, Dixon. Where are you going? Back to the caboose. No, you're not. Now put away the gun. You don't need it. You, uh, turn me in. You, you know what happens. Don't worry. I'm not turning you in. I'm gonna do you a favor. Just a little one. Me? Yeah. You, Alice Frisbee, me, and everybody involved. Mm-hmm. What's a favor? I'm gonna give you a chance to get off this train before anybody else sees you. <laughs> this thing's going 40 miles an hour. It slows down to about 15 outside of Mount Pleasant, just the other side of the bridge. It'll be around 20 minutes from now. You hop off there and we'll forget the whole thing. What about that broken seal on the hatch you're so worried about? And I'll tell Frisbee about it after we're out of Mount Pleasant. Once you're gone, it won't make any difference anyhow. Mm-hmm. What if he reports you for taking so long to say anything? So I broke a rule. He's breaking another, giving the old guy a ride. Both got something to forget. <laughs> hey, you're a pretty smart guy, Bobby. We could go quite a ways together. Yeah, well, not tonight we couldn't. Huh? No. Oh, you're getting off at Mount Pleasant. Question, Frank? Yes, sir. Keep writing, Miss Boone. I want this in the transcript. Uh, very well, Mr. Rogers. You have already stated that you realize Dixon boarded the train with a criminal motive. Yes, sir. And you have stated further that you realize the seriousness of the crime he intended to commit. Well, only after Frisbee told me how much money was in that sack. And yet, knowing all this, you still connive to let a would-be felon escape? Well, like I, I told you, I was thinking of other people involved. I mean, his wife, uh, Alice, and... And yourself? Yeah, and myself. Well, did you suppose, Plank, that the company was still unaware of the false statement you made in your application regarding the army discharge? Well, I... Y you mean you knew about it? The discrepancy became apparent over two months ago. <laughs> Why didn't you fire me? Because, upon investigating, we learned from the authorities that you had refused to defend yourself at the court-martial and were suspected of shielding the guilty party. Was that the pilfering that you referred to in your conversation with Dixon? Yeah. He was uh, the company's supply sergeant, and I was his clerk. Well, I, I, I knew what he was doing, but... But a misguided sense of loyalty kept you from speaking up. Well, it wasn't just that. It, you see, by the, at the time the court-martial came along, he and Alice were going together, and well, I thought if I said anything, she might think I just dragged him into it for spite. Apparently what this young lady thinks is very important to you. Used to be. It isn't anymore. So, because Dixon knew that you'd falsified your record to get a job and threatened to inform on you, you gave him an opportunity to escape. Yeah, that's right. And what happened after you left the freight car? Well, I closed the hatch and crawled back along the catwalk toward the caboose. Is, uh, one, one thing I couldn't afford was to have Frisbee or the old man leave the car any time before we got past Mount Pleasant. And after that, it wouldn't matter. So we sat around for the next 20, 20 minutes chewing the rag and listening to Pot tell lies about himself. Then I could tell by the sound of the wheels that we'd started across the bridge. Uh, we're coming into Mount Pleasant. Say, we're slowing down. I don't recollect this one making a stop here. <laughs> it doesn't, Pop. There's a grade on the other side of the bridge. Got to slow up for hey, it. Hey, go on, Pop. <laughs> Finish telling us how you licked the Kaiser, huh? Oh, well, now, I don't want to give the impression I'd done it single-handed. Uh, I sure wouldn't have got fur with a little pea shooter like that thing. This is a 32. Yeah, and that's just about the number of feet it'll fire. Now, when I was soldiering, they give you a pistol. You pump the slug, it'll knock a man back ten feet. Oh, picking up speed again. Hey, how about some checkers, Pop? Huh? I'm a gribble. <sighs> oh, Walt, by the way. Huh? I, uh, while I was out there making my rounds, I noticed the seal on one of the inspection hatches had been broken. Broken? Well, it's all right. I checked the inside of the car. Nothing's wrong. Well, if it's broken at all, that's wrong. Well, that's why I checked the car, to make sure it was empty. I'll tell you the truth. It, it didn't even look like a, a new seal. Uh, maybe they overlooked it, huh? Never heard of that happening. Well, that's how I found it. Nothing else was wrong. Which car? First one forward. I better go have a look. <laughs> You're the boss. Here, you strap on this gun. What do I need with it? Well, there's supposed to be an armed guard watching that mail sack every minute. Now, put this on and don't give me any trouble. Okay, whatever you say. I'll be right back. Just want to double check. Well, he sure got the wind up, hasn't he? Yeah. 
<laughs> He's the one was calling you eager. <laughs> well, maybe I am. Yeah. You want pretty hard to make good of this job, don't you, Sonny? Yep. Someone depending on you? A couple of people. My mother went out on a pretty big limb to get this job for me. Oh? Uh -huh. Yeah, she, uh, she used to know the man who's the head of the road now, the, uh, the president. She wrote him a letter. Well, you have got connections, haven't you? If I just don't wreck them. Well, I've always said it. Connections are an advantage, and a man who's got them and don't use them is a plain fool. I'd right, sit right where you are, Pop. Ben. You two bobbies, stay in the chair, get your hands up, don't turn around. That's the idea. Hey, where's Frisbee? Warm and dry on the floor of that freight car. <laughs> That's where I said he'd be. Okay, Bobby, on your feet now, real slow. Get over by Pop. Don't want everybody spread out here. Now keep your hands high so you won't be tempted to try for that gun on you. Listen, Ben, you'll never make it. Let me worry about that. Look, you're going to be identified. Frisbee never even knew what hit him. Yeah, Sonny, speaking of hitting people, that gun you got to... Don't worry, Pop. It won't go off unless I want it to. You mean until you want it to. Just keep your hands up, Bobby. Get the sack off the hook. Get, Get him, Sonny. Pick Jump. up his gun. Oh, you'll be fine. Just nicked your arm. Hey, Pop, what did you... I mean, when... Right out of your own holster, Bobby. Lucky you didn't have the safety on it. Except that's a terrible way to carry a pistol. Holy suffering cats. You better go forward to the next car and wake up Frisbee. Yeah. I'll just keep an eye on Benny the Kid here while you're gone. <laughs> I see. And you say that this pop character got off the train at Pilot Grove while you were turning Dixon over to the police and simply vanished. That's right, sir. Uh, Mr. Rogers... Yes, Frisbee? I think he did it to try to protect me from getting into trouble for giving him a ride. He probably figured if he wasn't there and Dixon didn't mention him, well, then we'd get the credit. I don't know, Walt. The more I go over the thing, the less that seems like the reason. What do you mean? Yes, Plank? Well, the minute Dixon stepped into the caboose, he called me by name, and the old man wouldn't have missed that. He, we could tell we knew each other, and I'm sure he must have been able to figure that, well, that Dixon had something on me. Well, be that as it may, he seems to have vanished without a trace. So we'll just have to take your word that the incident occurred as you described it. Well, I think that's all, gentlemen. You'll uh, be on temporary suspension until otherwise notified. Yes, Hey, Miss Spooner, you'll have that typed up for Mr. Claxon as soon as possible. Immediately, Mr. Rogers. Hey, well, you can uh, show these uh, gentlemen up. Mr. Rogers. Yes, please. I uh, just want to say that, well, whatever happens, I think I've been given a very fair hearing, sir, and well, I just hope... I that... understand, Plank. Uh, we'll let you know. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Miss Bean. Bye, Mr. Rogers. <coughs> yes? Well, yes, Mr. Claxon, I'll be right in. Well, you heard their statements over the intercom. Miss Spooner's typing up a full transcript. What's your general impression, sir? Young Plank's telling the truth from what I saw of it. Even to the part about the gun? You've been out on my target range, Rogers. I'm very good with the 32. Well, indeed, sir. But if you'll forgive my saying so, Mr. Claxton, this semi-annual uh, masquerade of yours in the tramp costume and the beard... And... You think it's childish? I think it's whiskey. Well, I'll go so far as to admit it's probably both, Rogers, but... It gets the work done, and I enjoy it. But, sir, the, the stockholders, what would they say? The only time the stockholders ever say anything, Rogers, is when they miss a dividend. Now, you're going to be president of this road someday, so remember that. But really, sir... Furthermore, I think it's high time you join me in one of these masquerades, as you call them. Oh, Mr. Claxon, no. You'll never be able to gauge the temper of your co-workers by going around and asking them questions in a gray suit and a Hamburg. I learned that a long time ago. But, Mr. Claxon... Also, take a memo. Plank stays on. His mother's a very fine lady. I took her to a dance once when I was a conductor. Yes, sir. And, and Frisbee? Oh, of course, Frisbee. He gave me a ride, didn't he? He's got a good heart. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I've got yours all picked out, Roger, so tell Miss Spooner you'll be leaving town for two weeks beginning the second week in February. You have my what already picked out, sir? Costume. Claw hammer coat with contrasting baggy trousers, plugged hat, cigar with toothpick. M Mr. Clarkson... It's a I... little exaggerated, I know, but you'll have to bum around as a sort of a character until you learn to slur your R's a bit better. 
Well, well, where are we going, sir? New Orleans, of course, like I told Frisbee in Mardi Gras. <laughs> Now, here again is James Gleason. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Do you remember the Edgar Allan Poe story, The Purloined Letter? In it, a person had to hide a letter, a very special letter, where no one would ever think of looking. He hid it on his mantelpiece in a handful of other letters. It's a classic story written about a very general human failing. Man's tendency to overlook the obvious. Most of us do it. Overlook the obvious, I mean. In the matter of prayer, for instance. Since 1947, Family Theatre has been suggesting family prayer as a means of keeping the families of America and the world strong and happy. And in these little talks at the end of each program, we've given you hundreds of reasons why you should pray as a family. But there's one reason which is really pretty obvious we'd like to point out. The greatest prayer God gave us is not even worded to be said by one person. It's worded to be said by a group or someone speaking for a group. Our Father is the name most of us give the prayer, not my Father. In it we ask that he lead us not into temptation, that he give us our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, and deliver us from evil. Not once, the Our Father or Lord's Prayer, does it become a personal petition rather than a family or group petition. I can think of no better endorsement for family prayer and the endorsement which already exists in the prayer God himself composed for us. Pray together as a family, and you'll find, too, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Hollywood Family Theater has brought you transcribed Caboose, starring James Gleason and Hugh O'Brien. Others in our cast were Herb Vigran, Charlotte Lawrence, Ben Wright, and Lamont Johnson. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present The Victim, starring Robert Rockwell. Gene Lockhart will be your host. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. <laughs>